All right, let's get started. It's a little bit after two Easter time here. So I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, Federal Highway Work Zone Management webinar on uh, positive protection strategies in work zones. Um, welcome you. Good morning, great afternoon, depending on where you are in the country here. Uh, my name's Alan Pate. I'm a project manager with Battelle leading up this project for them this, uh, this year. Um, today we'll have speakers um, from Federal Highway, Illinois Tollway, and North Texas Tollway Authority uh, presenting on, on, on these strategies. Uh, Jawad Pracha is un un unavailable today uh, due to some illness, so he is not uh, going to be able to speak with us, but uh, Martha Kapitanov from Federal Highway will take his place. Uh, I will be recording this and we'll make it available on Federal Highway's uh, Work Zone Management website later this summer once it's available. Uh, we'll have some Q&A sessions uh, after each speaker and at the end today, so um, please type any questions into the, uh, the Q&A uh, window and I will moderate those and direct them to the appropriate person. And then um, if you need a participation email uh, indicating that you participated today, please send me an email afterwards and we will get those out to you. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Martha. Good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Martha Capitano. I work for Federal Highway Office, Federal Highway Administration, Office of Operations and Headquarters on the Work Zone Management Team, and I will be uh presenting today on behalf of Joad. Uh Alan, would you please move to the next one? The next slide, please. There you go. Thank you. Uh this presentation was created and is being co-presented by not only Federal Highway, but representatives from Illinois Tollway and North Texas Tollway Authority. Uh, the views and opinion expressed today are the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Highway Administration or the USDOT. The contents do not necessarily reflect the official policy of the USDOT. Next, please. Uh, today's presenter, again, uh, my name is Martha and I'll be uh, presenting on behalf of Joat Parasha. We'll have Stephen Metnis from Illinois Tollway and Mark Bauma from North Texas Tollway Authority. Next, please. A uh, quick overview of the agenda. I will provide some uh, quick overview on the Federal Highway Works of Management Program, and then you'll have two presentations, experiences with various systems, and uh, questions and answers later. And we'll encourage everyone, if you have any questions throughout the presentations, to use the chat box. Thank you. Next, please. Work zones play a critical role in the preservation and enhancement of our nation's roadways. Although work zones play a critical role, they can also be a major cause of congestion and delay. Please remember about work zone safety when working towards zero deaths with your stakeholders. Over the past 10 years, fatal crashes in work zones nationally have increased from 521 in 2010 to 762 in 2019. The percent of all fatal crashes that occur in work zone has also increased slightly, whereas 1.7% of all fatal crashes in 2010 occur in work zones, 2.3% of all fatal crashes occur in work zones in 2019. The number of fatalities occurring in work zones has also increased from 546 in 2010 to 842 in 2019. Uh, further analysis of the 2019 data, 2019 being the latest data available at the national level. Uh, the data that I'm going to share, the first three bullets, are from the uh, NHTSA FARS data. When we look at the 2019 data, we notice that over 20% involve rear end collisions, uh, over 30%. Uh, speed was a contributing factor, and over 30% involve a commercial motor vehicle. And when I say a commercial uh, involve a commercial motor vehicle, it doesn't mean that the commercial motor vehicle uh, was at fault. It means that the commercial motor vehicle impacted another vehicle or was impacted by a vehicle. Now, 
Uh, we use the Bureau of Labor Statistics data for the workers, and uh, in 2019, we had 135 workers were killed in highway work zones. However, we're trying to have a better understanding of worker safety data. Uh, for example, when we use the uh, or analyze the FARS data for just 2019, it indicated that approximately 38% of pedestrian fatalities in work zones each year are actually roadway workers who are struck and killed by vehicles. Uh, similarly, worker fatality numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics include both traffic related and non traffic related uh, occupational accidents. Again, we, we are analyzing this data to get a better understanding on uh, workers killed in highway work zones. Next, please. This slide shows that most of work zone fatal crashes occur on higher speed roads, such as interstates and arterials. As compared to 2018, there was an increase in fatal crashes on all roadway types. However, when compared to the percentages of non work zone fatal crashes, the percentages of fatal work zone crashes are highly overrepresented on urban and rural interstates. I encourage you to visit the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse website for more information on work zone safety trends and related analysis. Next, please. Here's a quick overview of Federal Highway's work zone management program emphasis areas. I will highlight a few specifically related to safety. In our safety strategic planning effort, we're analyzing work zone safety data from 15 states to identify potential emphasis areas and related uh, research efforts. We'll be working with stakeholders before finalizing this uh, plan on improving work zone safety. We're also working with 10 opportunity states with the highest number of commercial motor vehicle and work zone related fatalities uh, to conduct targeted workshops and develop state specific action plans. In data related efforts, we're working on improving work zone related data collection and its use for various applications, ranging from the use of safety performance measures in process reviews required by regulation to use of real time work zone activity data for work zone management applications. Under the Federal Highway Work Zone Safety Grant Program, a significant number of work zone safety resources have been developed. Those are available on the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse website. And also, we have trained over 100,000 people uh, under this grant program. In addition to our in house work zone research, like inclusion of work zone scenarios in the Karma Initiative, we also identify opportunities elsewhere, such as uh, we recently, I'm sorry, for example, we recently developed a statement of work to get a better understanding of work zone intrusion data, and it was selected to be part of the fiscal year 2022 NCHRP projects. Next slide, please. Now let's focus on today's uh, topic, positive protection strategies to improve work zone safety. I would like to uh, mention or to remind everyone about the temporary traffic control device, which is part of the 23 Code of Federal Regulation, Section 630, Subpart K, also known as Subpart K uh, by a lot of people. This regulation uh, became effective in December of 2008, uh, was developed to emphasize systematic consideration of road user and worker safety and identify strategies like positive protection devices, exposure, control measures, law enforce, use of law enforcement, and ensuring safety entry exit of work vehicles. Uh, positive protection devices, or PPD, is defined as a device that contains and or redirects vehicles and meet crashworthiness evaluation criteria. Next, please. This slide shows more information on positive protection devices and other exposure control measures. We want to highlight the criteria in subpart K, as well as resources that are available for agencies to have policies and practices that ensure systematic consideration of road user and worker safety. 
typically PPDs, uh, PPD is a longitudinal traffic barrier, such as a temporary concrete, steel, or water fill barrier. In this webinar, we will look at a couple of innovative uh, positive protection technologies, which agencies have used successfully to improve work zone safety. This concludes my presentation. Uh, back to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Before we move on, there is a question though that came in regarding some of the earlier slides. Um, I guess I can go back to it here, maybe. Um, what makes speed a contributing factor? Exceeding the speed limit, driving too fast for conditions, or something else? Um, I believe is the way it was um, included in the fatality report. So it's it most likely over, going over the speed limit or the posted speed limit. You have to remember sometimes in a work zone, uh, state may reduce the speed limit and uh, that will become, if it's a black and white sign, it will become the, that um, posted speed limit. So for that particular case, yeah, it will be, uh, that they were speeding going beyond the posted speed limit. All right, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to switch to Steve here. I hit the wrong button. So, uh, um, yeah, so we encourage anybody who has questions to use the chat box. But, okay, thank you. Okay. Next, we have uh, Steve Mendes from Illinois Tollway. And Steve, I'll let you give a brief introduction of yourself because unfortunately, I just lost the email that has the words that you gave me. So take it away, please. No worries, I'll ad lib as best I can. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Steve Mendes. I am the general manager of traffic and incident management with the Illinois Tollway. I've been with the Illinois Tollway now coming up on 18 years. Uh, started my career in maintenance, uh, driving trucks, main, maintaining the roads, plows, you, you name it. Uh, worked my way up through uh, supervision at the M sites. Uh, my previous uh, position as incident manager, and now I am the general manager, which oversees that prior position, as well as our ITS group, our traffic operations center, dispatch center, and um, anything and everything incident related is uh, pretty much funneled through my department. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say again, thank you for having me, Jawad. Thank you, uh, Martha, for in the introduction and the Federal Highway for the invitation to present to you today. Turn off my camera so you don't get uh, distracted by my movements throughout. And we'll continue on. So with this first slide you're seeing here, uh, Again, we at the Illinois Tollway were committed to providing and promoting a safe and efficient system of toll roads throughout Northern Illinois. Um, we also strive to ensure the highest possible service to our customers, which obviously translates to safety. That's a top priority for us for everything that we do, not only for our customers, but also for the men and women who build, repair, and maintain our roads and bridges. The use of mobile work zone barrier trailers is just one of the positive protection strategies we use to keep our workers and customers safe. Uh, but before I get into the details of the mobile barriers, I'd like to give you some background on the Illinois Tollway system. So, as you see here, Illinois Tollway is made up of five roadways that span 294 centerline miles throughout 12 counties in, in northern Illinois. These consist of the Tri-State Tollway, so that's I-94, 294, and I-80 the Jane Adams Memorial Tollway, I-90, Reagan Memorial Tollway, I-88, Veterans Memorial Tollway, I-355, and Illinois Route 390. The tollway is separate from the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, we are a user fee system, so no state or federal dollars are used to support the maintenance or operations of the tollway system, so only those who use the system pay for it. And as a user fee system, the Illinois Tollway considers those who drive on its system to be customers. So we wanna make sure that we take every effort to minimize the impacts of construction or roadway maintenance incident response on the free flow of traffic. And the safety of our customers is always the topmost on our minds. So the safety of our customers and workers 
led to the Illinois Tollway exploring the need for mobile work zone barriers. We purchased two of these barriers in 2016. Uh, the process was pretty in depth when it came to uh, the, the putting it out for bid. We were specific on what we were looking for, size, um, what the barrier would provide, uh, mobility, uh, things of that nature. So once it put out to bid in 2014, uh, went through the process and we were able to actually complete the purchase in 2016. Uh, we didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We knew that some other states and departments of transportation had successfully used these barriers, uh, which included North Texas Tollway Authority, uh, the states of Texas, California, New Jersey, Missouri, and Pennsylvania. Uh, the barriers themselves place a significant mass between passing traffic and workers, providing a safe work zone for prolonged exposure to traffic during maintenance and repair activities, uh, incident response, um, the providing of the 102 feet of work zone protection is one or more of the uh, sections of wall can be removed or shortened when necessary. Uh, each one of the sections of wall measures about 20 feet. The mobile work zone barriers can be deployed quickly to the scene of incidents and can be configured to protect the right side or left side of the incident or work area, depending on the circumstances. We have a mobile work zone barrier available. Uh, if we have it available, it can be dispatched almost immediately. We hook it up to a tractor, take it on the road, uh, it's ready to go. The barrier features uh, an integrated rigid wall trailer that can be towed by a standard semi-tractor to any location where workers are performing roadway maintenance. These trailers meet the requirements of NCHRP 350 and the MASH level TL3 or higher. Uh, mobile barriers can be removed immediately after an incident is cleared or maintenance is completed, allowing for the free flow of traffic to resume. And again, that was one of the big points for us uh, as an agency is reducing worker exposure um, with the implementation, depending on the activity. Um, for us, it makes sense as with any roadway activity, if it's gonna take you longer to implement or deploy the maintenance of traffic than for the actual activity itself, or there's a variety of activities happening within a, a small uh, time frame or, or, or span of, of uh, activities throughout a small or a short duration. We wanna do what we can to provide that protection, but to do it in an expeditious manner. And that, this mobile work zone barrier allowed for that. Um, each of the units has a rear mounted LED aero board. It's elevated front and rear corner mounted LED flashing beacons. It has reflective red and white tape on both sides of standard DOT tape for reflectivity and conspicuity, conspicuity at night uh, and during the day. Uh, and both sides of the rear of the trailer uh, have LED stop, tail, turn, and marker lights. Uh, the barriers are especially useful at night. They are equipped with high powered lights that help make the work area, area highly visible. So it illuminates the, the work area within the protected zone. Um, and allows it to be more visible to drivers as they're they're approaching and driving through the work zone. The trailers also have truck mounted style crash attenuators uh, mounted to the rear uh, that meets both NCHRP and MASH standards. These attenuators provide impact protection uh, from the rear of the work zone. Side impacts are protected by the heavy metal barriers on, along the side. So obviously again, our work is pretty broad spectrum when it comes to roadway maintenance. Um, some of the needs were including the uh, protection of bridge expand, uh, expansion joint repair work, pothole repairs, uh, lane marker, uh, guardrail repair, delineator repairs, plaza repairs, uh, emergency repairs, bridges, plazas, et cetera, night work. Um, and we've also deployed these for scene protection if we're going to be out for an extended period of time for a severe injury or a fatality crash or anything that could be considered a crime scene uh, commercial vehicle crash recovery again prolonged activities durations out on the roadway we want to make sure that we're going above and beyond to provide a protective space for our uh, workers for the drivers also uh, to provide a protective area sometimes it's not just a matter of uh, distraction but uh, losing control of a vehicle due to inclement weather. Just to give an example, we want to make sure that they're also protected and not running into, um, you know, devices or, or objects that could 
cause further damage or, or injuries. Um, they also have along the side of those walls, as you can see there in the picture, their storage space for tools, equipment, and supplies. And so continuing on, the Illinois Tollway um, uses this mobile work zone barrier on a wide variety of maintenance projects. And what you could see here, um, overhead truss sign repair work being performed. Um, again, getting back to the District 15, Illinois State Police investigations teams. Again, we wanna make sure that the work being done and the employees performing that work, whether it's maintenance work, contract work, or state police, uh, any responders that are out there, we wanna make sure they can focus on their work and also know that they're being protected while doing so. We'll use the uh, the barriers again um, in the next slide that I'll show you here. Got a picture, uh, visual is always uh, something that provides a, a better perspective. So logistics, getting back to the size, uh, there's a lot that goes into deploying a more, uh, mobile work zone barrier. It's, it's, it's very similar to driving a 53-foot uh, tractor trailer on the roadway, um, which takes special skills. And there are some areas on our system, oops, went a little too fast there. There are some areas on our system where these barriers can't be turned around. Uh, if you've got a, a, a circle ramp uh, interchange that's got tight turns, uh, these things have to be pre-planned before you can uh, deploy this this device out there because you don't want to find out uh, when you get to the bottom of a, an exit ramp or an entrance ramp that's got a tight turn bay that you're not going to make that turn. So again, uh, working these these things out ahead of time is is crucial to a successful deployment. And then again, some of the trailers, they, um, they also, have a reduced uh, location for storage. Some of our M sites don't have the, the space to provide the, the proper storage area for uh, a device such as, as, as this with the, uh, again, the 102 foot uh, stance that it has. So again, planning where you can store it at the end of the activities, uh, making sure that the, the other um, M sites or uh, requesters know where it's located. Those are some of the things that we try to, uh, to work out ahead of time so we can pl uh, plan accordingly. And then um, with deployment, the trailer needs to be followed by pilot trucks uh, to, to block lanes and assist with turning corners, switching lanes, and then uh, again, getting into position. It's a, it's a lengthy piece of equipment. Um, it's a lot of bells and whistles and, and, um, and a lot that goes into successful deployment. And again, we wanna make sure that there's a protective uh, bubble around this, this piece of equipment as it's being deployed as, as well. So again, you can see now we've got the device in place and we've got our teams up, up there on, this is our stretch on the Jane Adams. Um, they're working on our lane control signals. Uh, these are above our smart work zone, uh, the gantry system there. Now we know that your typical application would provide, um, and this is just uh, using mobile uh, applications as an example, You've got your array of uh, TMA trucks that are, are following the, the work crews out there providing protection from the uh, approaching traffic. And then you may or may not, depending on the, the length of work being done, deploy cones or, or barrels or barricades along the side of the work zone up to and through the termination zone to provide that, that proper um, management area. But this is just one of those added layers of protection that we felt that, again, any errant vehicles, somebody losing control, uh, work zone intrusion, this has a, a dramatic impact on the protection of our workers while they're out there. And as you can see, they're able to focus on their on the job at hand, uh, continue to uh, perform those duties, uh, clean up and, and get off the scene and get traffic moving back to the posted rates. So again, included in the purchase of the two mobile work zone barriers was 16 hours of training provided by the, uh, the, the providers. Uh, for operation and maintenance. And as mentioned earlier, the transportation of the mobile work zone barrier is like driving a 53 foot tractor trailer. So this requires experienced class A CDL holding drivers who are comfortable with driving it. Uh, drivers also need to understand proper maintenance of traffic, uh, placement of the trailer, uh, aero direction and strobe usage, uh, things like that. Drivers need to know how to lower and raise the attenuator. So once they get out onto the scene, um, it is able to be deployed um, 
it's able to be raised and lowered uh, either from in, inside the cab with a remote switch or manually using a toggle switch from outside of the unit. Um, it's vitally important for our drivers to be aware when they are exiting the cab that there's live traffic uh, on either side of the, the driver's side of the truck. And then for maintenance, we've got certified mechanics who must possess the specialized knowledge on the maintenance and repair of the trailer. Uh, and this is no different than any other piece of equipment. We ensure that uh, it's, it's visually inspected. There's a pre-trip, post-trip, uh, ensuring you know any welds or um, anything that may or may not um, you know deem it to be unsafe for travel. We want to make sure that that's that's caught before we deploy it. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, if there's are any con safety concerns for again the uh, during the usage uh, after ensuring all the safety lights and uh, the aero boards and everything are functional, this is something that's happening before, during, and, and after its use each usage. Now here again, another video, just to give you a visual as it's deployed, you can see the employees are able to focus on doing just that. They, they stage their vehicles, they're able to get up in their buckets, uh, deployed out there for incident response, uh, guardrail repair, you name it. The, the employees, the, the, the responders are able to focus on the job at hand. And you can see how quickly it's able to be broken down uh, and moved on to the next location. And Again, as a user fee based system as such as the tollway, we want to ensure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that lane closures are a last resort. Uh, but if we do have to implement them that we're able to do so expeditiously safely and efficiently uh, get the job done, clear the scene and get traffic moving back uh, to the posted rate again that's safer for. Not only our responders for our workers, but for the motoring public as well, any disruption in traffic uh, could potentially lead to secondary crashes, traffic queuing, uh, anything that can go into uh, to a hazardous condition. We try to avoid that, and this is an excellent tool to assist in that uh, safe deployment. So in our experience, the mobile work zone barriers have been highly effective in protecting our workers. Um, as, of, as of late, we don't have an exact study or a figure to support that, but we know from, from the utilization over the last couple of years, uh, we try to deploy this unit at every chance that we get. Um, it's it's logistically uh, coordinated through our throughout our maintenance sections. They talk amongst themselves. Hey, I've got this activity going. They try to plan accordingly because again, if it's available, we we're making sure that we're, we're we're deploying it to provide that added layer of protection. Again, we don't have a study to to, to say that this is what we've seen as a result of its usage, but um, the field staff. Uh, responders that have been uh, part of the, the the usage of this and the protection, they can't speak highly enough of it. It's it's shown and it's proven to to do just that. As they're out there, they feel better. Uh, they're able to perform their duties uh, and feel safer while they're doing so. And and that's that's all we're looking for is to make sure that our our people we know that the safest place to be is is back at the the garage or back at the firehouse or at the police station. But we know at some point we're going to be deployed out on these roadways uh, and, and we're going to need protection while we're doing our, our duties out there. Um, so our roadway maintenance crews that have used the, the mobile work zone barriers have, have expressed feeling safer and more confident while working uh, within the unit. Traffic seems to slow down significantly in the areas where the, tra uh, the trailers are used. And that's something our roadway maintenance staff appreciates. Um, I, I'm sure it could be equated to just the stance, the, the pure uh, size. Uh, of the unit itself, it catches people's eye. Um, and that's what we want. We want them to be aware that there's something in the road they they should be slowing down, uh, using caution when proceeding up to and through that work zone. And this definitely provides that. Um, because the barriers move uh, are moved in and out, they're much less disruptive to drivers. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, it's easier to, to set this up as opposed to the series of cones or barrels or barricades along the side of the work zone to provide that uh, extra protection. And again, reducing exposure to traffic uh, for our workers is, is huge in the uh, remaining safe while they're doing their, their, their uh, respective positions out there, uh, performing their duties, and, and we can't ask for anything more than that. Um, with that, I believe that concludes uh, my portion here. I thank you, and at some point, I believe we'll be uh, able to answer any questions if there are any. 
Thank you, Steve. Yes, let's answer a couple of questions right now that uh, were, were posted. Uh, first one is uh, roughly what is the cost of the mobile barrier? So we're in the, um, I believe for both units, we were somewhere in the area of about uh, $850,000. And that's with all the, uh, the handful of the accessories that were put on there, the TMA, some of the lighting, things like that. Okay, and then a related question that just came up is, what is the cost savings utilizing these versus more traditional methods? Uh, that's a great question. I don't necessarily have a study to, to back that up, but like I said before, the, the on the scene um, comments and, uh, and information that we've gathered from the, the individuals that we've protected while we brought this out there, I think that's, that's uh, priceless. Okay, thank you. Um, what about any uh, any difficulties you've had using it, uh, other than the, uh, the the size of it and driving so forth? But any other uh, lessons learned in terms of difficulties or things people need to uh, be aware of? No, I think um, some of the the early issues that we were made aware of um, had to do with the, uh, the the raising and lowering of the the TMA at the back of the unit. But as far as the operation. Um, We've had no major or significant maintenance uh, concerns. Um, again, driving is just like any of our drivers are they're CDL holders, so they're they're able to to maneuver large vehicles such as this. Uh, so they're comfortable doing that. It is a specialized piece of equipment, so there are some nuances to it. You're not seeing it as a large box or a, a tractor trailer that you normally would be able to see all the components while you're maneuvering it. It is a little bit lengthier, so there's just some training that that goes into it and some extra caution that needs to be taken while it's being utilized. But other than that, we, we've seen no, no major issues. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions that have been posted so far. Uh, we'll move on to Mark's presentation, but if there's more questions related to Steve's, uh, please enter them and we will, uh, at the end of the uh, webinar today, we'll come back and answer questions about both presentations. So thank you, Steve. Uh, let's transition to Mark here. And Mark, I'll, once again, we'll let you make your own introduction. Mark, it looks like you're on mute. Okay, let me try this again. There yeah, you go. Thank you, Alan. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with everyone today. And let me see if I can start sharing my screen here um, on and, and talk about some of the NTTA's uh, work that we've been doing to improve uh, work zone safety. As a quick introduction, um, I came out of college starting to work in a consulting site. Uh, doing construction management actually on NTTA tollway uh, projects as they were expanding. In 1998, uh, I was drafted by the NTTA to uh, help lead the design and construction of uh, several of our roadway systems. And I uh, was fortunately a year later to become the director of engineering, uh, kind of helping to lead all of the planning, design, and construction of uh, at that point was a rapidly expanding toll road uh, system because it was about 20 miles of toll road when I started. We're currently operating 150 center line miles. Uh, in late 2007, as we were addressing some of the large expansions of our systems, we reorganized, uh, creating a project delivery department. And I took uh, the responsibility as a technical oversight leader to uh, direct and provide quality assurance over right-of-way acquisition, design, and construction. Since that time, uh, I've got the dubious title of senior corridor manager, but basically I have all those responsibilities. Plus, I've tacked on to that all of the, the maintenance engineering, uh, which I'm in charge of. So, plenty of opportunities here at NTTA. So, talking a little bit about NTTA and a little bit of history, uh, we were founded in 19... 1997 uh, by legislative act, but we're actually the successor of the Texas Turnpike Authority, which was created in 1954. Uh, 
so uh, we are a political subdivision of the state. So we are an agency of the state, but our revenue system is entirely driven by collection of tolls. Now, to orient you, we are in the North Texas area, Dallas-Fort Worth region uh, specifically, and uh, chartered to, um, initially chartered to design, construct, operate, maintain toll roads in the four county region, Dallas-Fort Worth, with the ability to expand into uh, surrounding counties. But again, primarily focused here on the North Texas uh, region. Um, and uh, let me just, uh, okay, anyway, uh, continuing on, where I want to really start on is let's talk about the NTTA mission statement. One of the things I worked on very hard with NTTA and was able to create was getting safety as a big part of our mission statement. And that really is a, a big element. Our mission statement starts with that safety. And we look at that in all the things we do as we're uh, working to develop and maintain uh, the infrastructure that we have here in our roadway system. So talking about what are what are our roadways, uh, this map generally shows the roadways that NTTA uh, currently has in operation. Uh, several more significant roadways, the the Dallas North Tollway, North South uh, facility, and that's where I'm going to be focusing a lot of my discussion today on that. But we also operate several other um, significant facilities in the Sam Rayburn Tollway, the President George Bush Turnpike, which is an outer loop around the Dallas Metroplex, Chisholm Trail Parkway on the very west side. Most recently, we've added the 360 Tollway, uh, which was a joint operation with TxDOT, where they initially funded the design and construction. We've taken it over for operation, and here is just last week, We've uh, fully repaid the loan and is fully brought into our system. And then we've got a couple of smaller, some of those called boutique projects that uh, tunnel under Addison Airport, uh, a local airport, uh, and a couple of toll bridges, one across Mountain Creek Lake in the West Dallas side, and then on towards the very Northwest portion of the region, Louisville Lake Toll Bridge. So those the overall central uh, systems about as it said, 150 center line miles, about 1,200 lane miles that we we operate and maintain. So, uh, and it is, you know, we continue to look at growth. Uh, you see the orange at the top of the map is future extensions of the Dallas North Tollway, and we've got some portions under construction now and in further planning and design effort. And we're also looking at extensions of the Bush Turnpike Loop, uh, it's that green on the right-hand side of the map, um, and, and continued expansions in some of the other roadway systems, which all in all boils out to about a $1.5 billion capital plan that we have over the next five years. So the, the challenge with our roadways and this meme uh, that floated around Twitter a while back kind of shows it is, uh, Comparison of some of the Dallas roadways, you know, the tollways are high speed and you know, high quality uh, transportation that we have in the region, and so that that represents some of the challenges and part of what led us to looking at a movable concrete traffic barrier system. So as we talk about movable concrete traffic barrier, you also hear me refer to it as MCTB, uh, the acronym. Uh, the system we use, it, yes, it is proprietary system by uh, Lindsay Transportation Solutions. Uh, was first used in the Dallas area for putting in a contraflow uh, managed lane system on Interstate 30 from downtown east towards Mesquite. Uh, coming out of the Dallas downtown region, it's uh, used daily basis to open an additional contra, contra flow lane and it's operated by the Dallas area rapid transit uh, which is our um, bus and rail uh, provider in this region um, when Lindsay had 
approached this many times over the past. Our, a lot of our initial discussions were, were looking at it on the Dallas North Tollway to see how could we use a system like this to uh, handle directional traffic. Because at that time, the Dal Dallas North Tollway was operating about 70, a 70-30 70 split at uh, during peak periods. Since that time, we've gotten much more 50-50 and we saw where those trends were going. So that didn't really work out, but we did see the value in looking at the system from a standpoint of how could it be used in construction zones, especially in what is a very congested corridor. So talk briefly about some of the projects where we have used the uh, uh, MCTB, the Movable Concrete Traffic Barrier, we've, we've used it in four projects to date. The first one, starting about 2005, was a widening at the south end of the Dallas North Tollway, or DNT. Um, we were doing a combination of outside widenings, bridge replacements, uh, and, and a significant toll plaza replacement uh, on it. This was about a $34 million project. Uh, and using the MCTB was part of that. And again, to we're a user pay system, not unlike what Steve sp spoke of earlier, having lanes open during peak periods, uh, very important. Our second project uh, was a widening further north on the tollway through Plano. And some of the challenges we had in that uh, project were that uh, it was an outside widening through its entire length because when the DNT was originally developed, uh, it was like six lanes is all you'll ever need. Uh, and you know, I worked on that project back in the early '90s, and you know, they, at that point they said 30-year traffic projection was not about 90,000 vehicles a day. Well, guess what? We're operating about 180,000 vehicles per day pre-COVID. So uh, definitely saw the need to add capacity. Now widening, especially in depressed areas where we needed to be able to create work zones for the contractor um, at, to be able to remove existing walls, build new walls, again, during off-peak periods, the move uh, barrier was really the solution that we actually as an agency introduced to our designers uh, to use for this project. Um, the subsequent projects that we've used have been uh, where we've done median barrier replacement. First on the south end of the Dallas North Tollway, uh, the original median barrier from 1968, which was actually one of the first Jersey barrier installations in the state of Texas uh, at that time, really was w worn out. We were seeing issues with brittle concrete, uh, a lot of damage when it was getting hit. So we were replaced it with single slope barrier. And by in using the movable barrier, we had a way to protect that center line when the old barrier came out, create a safe work zone uh, during our off-peak periods. And again, we allowed us to have the full lane capacities uh, when during the peak period times in the mornings and the evenings. And then we currently have a contract underway doing similar work, median barrier replacement um, really what we would call a middle section of the Dallas North Tollway between Interstate 635 and the President George Bush Turnpike, PGBT. Uh, again, replacing what's a combination of cast in place and precast lengths of Jersey barrier coming in with an all cast in place uh, concrete traffic barrier through there. And uh, you know, the MCTB was a key part of having a solution for being able to effectively build this, both from a time standpoint and as well as safety. So um, talk a little bit about why we have, you know, the reasons for getting into the MCTB on those projects. You can see on the picture on the right, that is the Dallas North Tollway, the southern portions of it. It's uh, a very narrow corridor. It, it was built in a 100 foot wide railroad right away. Six lanes in this uh, section with some widenings for ramps. And so it's, it's very tight. There is no inside shoulder, uh, basically a two foot offset from the stripe to the barrier. Uh, we've got mountable curb, 
uh, in this area, so it's difficulty in moving uh, traffic over onto the shoulder. And then, you know, through the Dallas North Tollway, we have the challenges of dealing with high speeds uh, on that. The section of the tollway was 50 mile an hour design speed, largely by vertical curves that limit sight distance. We go further north. It was also a 50 mile an hour design speed. And granted, these are older 50 mile an hour design speeds. So it's got curves up to five degrees horizontal in the roadway. And guess what? Our 85th percentile is over 70 miles an hour. We actually have it speed limited at 65, but uh, with the narrow corridor, it's difficult to do enforcement. We have regular commuters, they drive fast. Uh, and we have a lot of traffic, you know, say up to 8,000 vehicles per hour in a three lane section, much more than the theoretical capacity on that. And that's partly because, you know, our drivers think it's NASCAR training out there. They don't tailgate, they draft. Uh, cause that's about the only way we can get that kind of, that we see that kind of throughput. Fortunately, our safety records is very good on the roadway, but, um, it definitely creates challenges, especially trying to work out there due to the volumes of traffic. We do a lot of our work at night and we're all dealing with the distracted and inebriated drivers that, uh, occasion on our roadway. So, you know, that became a big part of safety. And so one of the, some of the big things we saw of benefits of doing that was improving safety in our construction work zones. Uh, we've been fortunate with no work zone fatalities or significant injury wrecks in the work zones. In fact, uh, pretty much any of the hits that we've seen through this area uh, on the barrier system itself, usually been outside the areas where the contractor's working. Our, um, our contractors definitely feel much safer. I mean, we've gotten quotes from workers that if it wasn't for having that barrier in place, they would quit before they would work out in those work zones. It's, again, it's the high, tra the high traffic, the high speed traffic. Um, it is setting up the system is quick. It, uh, Basically, your the transfer machine operates at uh, about five to eight miles per hour. So we're setting up as fast uh, as if you were setting up barrels, if not maybe a little bit faster. Um, and let's say it gives us a continuous protection through the work zones. Don't have cars trying to duck through the barrels and such. So there's been a lot of benefit in using the system. So we want to talk a little bit about what is this cost to implement, it's not cheap. Um, our initial uh, implementation, we worked with a, we kind of priced it like a monthly traffic barrier uh, system, our monthly barrier rental cost. Um, it's a term I'm looking for, uh, basically is, is uh, your monthly work zone protection. So uh, wasn't the ideal way to do it. Uh, but it's about 1.9 million on, on a total project that was in the order of uh, $35 million. So um, the, you know, it was a still a significant percentage of that project. When our second project, uh, one of our lessons learned, and I'll speak to this a little bit more later, was changing up how we did the bid items where uh, rather than just making it a monthly item, uh, we moved it to uh, furnish, manipulate, remove, and also we had a move on the project, which is to basically move barrier from one location to another, where it had to be physically disconnected and moved. Uh, on this widening from Parker Road to Sam Rayburn Tollway that was in Plano, uh, the second project I showed earlier, uh, was about $3 million on a total $79 million job. So, um, Again, uh, I haven't compared that, what, you know, but if we just use static barriers, it would have probably been about half that. Uh, but on the other hand, it would have made some of the work zones much more difficult to use. Uh, in our two median barrier replacement projects, we've definitely seen uh, it's, the, the cost hasn't really, hasn't come down with time. The, uh, for the 2017 project, uh, it represented $4 million out of a $20 million barrier replacement and overlay project. 
Um, so significant cost on that. Uh, one thing you'll see in these costs, uh, our cost tracking has definitely been higher than what the manufacturer's literature claims that it, it costs. Uh, and I think that's partly it may be more the manufacturer cost. It's not necessarily what the contractor uh, has priced it at, uh, both for their additional labor that's involved in the work, risk, et cetera, and somewhat the some of the unknowns that come with the system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. This last project that is currently underway is a median barrier only uh, project. So therefore it does represent, you know, at 4.9 million out of a $13 million job, the uh, using the MCTB is quite expensive. Now the price of the system went up significantly for the installation because we went to a newer generation um, of the uh, MCTB, which is a reactive tension system. It's one of the early implementations of this system. So uh, having to, part of the cost that we're absorbing is, is uh, manufacture of, of that new barrier. There wasn't existing stockpiles that could easily be provided on it. Significant cost, yes, but uh, again, it's what price do we put on safety? And the reality is, we couldn't hardly think of a, any other way to build this project. So what are some of the challenges that we've overcome? You know, and part of this, as you can see from the pricing, was looking at how do we price, uh, how do we spec it? And so our first version of specifications was largely using manufacturer's recommended uh, specs, uh, work modified it for our needs. But as you saw in that first pricing, was it was, on a pay per month element that left the, the contractors with a lot of unknowns, you know, especially when we found out and feedback, well, the vendor was charging them up front for the barrier, uh, providing it, but they were only getting paid on a monthly basis. So the contractor was uh, basically funding a lot of that work up front or it was coming out of some of the mobilization costs. Uh, by just having it per month, it made it hard to adjust and adapt to the project, like bringing different quantity into it. And the specification also put a lot of risk on the contractor for repair. Because one of the things we learned is, guess what? The attenuators get hit and they get used up. Um, and so we updated the specification in the second project, uh, second and third project, uh, by changing the, the bid items. So we had a furnish and install uh, move, remove, uh, manipulate by the month, which really paid for the transfer machine uh, and those daily or nightly uh, movings. We did make it a plan quantity item. So the contractor at least had a, uh, could cover his lease costs on the machine uh, on it. You know, we took some risk if they finished the project early, but they took risk if the project was gonna run long. And uh, with the attenuators, yes, we definitely found that uh, we put started to put extra quantity in there because they got hit, and that way we could also use the bid item to fully replace a uh, attenuator if necessary. In this most recent project, we've gone to the uh, what's called their Lindsay's Concrete Reactive Tension System. Uh, it is a mash uh, TL3 rated barrier. Versus the other older system was just NH RCP 350 gave us a, a narrower footprint, which was really important on the on the DNT because we were trying to set that barrier between the toe of existing barrier and the yellow stripe, which was a two foot wide zone. This allowed us to sit in there without having to restripe the roadway, which we had just put a brand new overlay on, and we uh, were concerned about trying to remove stripe would damage our overlay, and um, narrowing lane widths, which were already down to 11 foot in a lot of areas. Uh, we required uh, the you know, yellow reflective strip, new reflective yellow strips to be put on all the barrier, two barrier transfer machines, because partly to help with uh, redundancy on the project, but also since we're typically setting up uh, the lane closures in both directions allowed the contractor to set up a lot quicker and get more out of their work window because for the most part we were giving them from 10 p.m. at night to 5 a.m. in the morning. So if we could reduce the time they spent setting up, it gave them more time to work. 
required client also required contractor to stockpile extra attenuators because uh, we definitely uh, worked on one previous projects. Uh, you know, when we first set out traffic control and just shows that sometimes the distract drivers. We had 27 hits in the first month on attenuators, and it's like we can't hardly replace them as fast as they were hitting them. We made some some changes to help uh, improve upon that. So a few lessons learned uh, on the systems as we worked, uh, you know, and this is where we showed this showed up in our specifications, the, the barrier transfers machines, you know, some first projects, uh, we got an old machine with new paint. And so uh, requiring higher performance, newer machines on that, the second machine, as I, I noted, uh, staging the machine closer to the work zone. Because having to road it to the the location, getting it across length traffic typically takes a rolling lane closure or uh, even full roadway closure. Getting it closer to the project so you spend less time mobilizing definitely saved us. We have found some challenges in our most recent project that uh, of the machine having enough power to climb uh, grades. And we've got about four to five percent grades in a couple locations on our main lanes, and when you combine that with a curve. And it's trying to stretch barrier out as you move it around the curve. The machine just didn't have enough guts. And we've worked through that. Part of that was by introducing a lot more adjustable sections in the curve. It is part of the standard package to bring some of the adjustable sections in uh, for curve areas so that the barrier system can shrink or stretch as you go uh, put it out. But we found in some of these curves, uh, we had to start putting those in oh, about every 12 to 15 sections of concrete to uh, really allow the machine to be able to effectively move it on it. Training was a, uh, has been a constant headache, and some of that is contractor turnover. Uh, with uh, active construction markets, we have people come and leave, so training is, has been an ongoing element. Vendors been uh, very good in helping us there. Um, as you can see in that one picture, some you know we definitely fussed about some of the quality of the barrier that was being brought out on some of the earlier projects. Uh, you know, some of it was well used, uh, beat up. It still met all the safety requirements, but uh, we were looking for a little better. So we've added some requirements there again in the specifications, and a big part of that was requiring additional reflective uh, strips on that. Uh, one of the other things going back onto the barrier transfer machine was uh, one of the challenges we had with it was when, you know, we wanted the second machine for redundancy and breakdown, but when it broke down, uh, one of those things that I plan to do in the next project where we would use this is that aspect has to be trained because we had a breakdown. And while in theory, you're supposed to be able to tow the machine with a heavy truck, uh, even with the vent, uh, Vendors, uh, representatives on site, nobody could figure out how to do it and it took us about eight hours to move the machine. So uh, that's going to become a practice. I think both training as well as probably practice that actually before the next project. Uh, other lessons learned, you know, attenuators, take your pessimistic op uh, estimate and double it. Um, Looks like one projects we definitely ran through a lot of them. Uh, we fe we definitely reduced hits once we started looking carefully at how we align uh, the attenuator nose and you know trying to slight just pull it away slightly from traffic, just getting it a foot or two off of the edge line uh, taper definitely reduced the number of hits. Stormwater runoff. Uh, for the most part, wasn't an issue. We did see a little bit of buildup in some of the sags, especially when the barrier had been set there and there was some dirt and debris starting to accumulate. Uh, so it's something we definitely have to watch for. We found through the design of these projects that as the owner, we probably knew more about using movable barrier than our designers did. And so it was definitely educating them on how to best put it in and when to use it. Uh, because it's all we I think we saw the pendulum swing a little bit of oh this must be your solution we'll use it everywhere, well it doesn't necessarily need to be used everywhere it's got to be used smartly. Similarly, 
the challenge has been getting the contracting community to accept and be comfortable with it. We've worked hard with contractors, but still as it is over four projects, we've had three different contractors. And when I look at, go back and look at who bid it, we only about had a half a dozen contractors that were bidding this. So while we three contractors, four projects sounds pretty good. When I look at uh, three of these jobs only had two bidders you know, on it uh, or two or maybe three bidders. So uh, getting the contracting community familiar with it is something I think continued opportunity we have. Uh, we definitely found on the barrier replacement projects, designing our t traffic control plan with shorter runs of barrier, uh, because once you move it out, create a lane, it's kind of the contract bringing materials in and out. You just got that lane closed. Sometimes when it's two lanes, it's a little bit better, but it's funneling materials in and out. So by reducing some of the work zone links, we could have separate work zones operational and we wouldn't the contractor wouldn't be blocking himself in uh hits on the barrier shown in the top photo uh it definitely will create a pocket you got to make sure that uh as you set the system in place that you can accommodate it so if we're on can't be right on the very edge of a bridge uh, with the system because it, it will deflect when hit uh and when we get a pocket like that you got to get out there and get it fixed and let's say even everything you do, the driver still will give uh, do what you didn't think about. So kind of concluding on this and uh, what we saw on this is, you know, one of our big goals was keeping all the lanes open during peak traffic, uh, being in the user pay system, having traffic lanes open was kind of a given. So finding a way to still build our roadway safely and have lanes open during that was a big part of it. You know, and when we looked at the like, safety aspects, you know, we couldn't really put a price on safety. And so, yes, it was uh, expensive, but when you look at the importance of safety, uh, this was a very good solution. We definitely have gotten that you know, the contractors definitely, and even feedback from the public has been, you know, we're making that work zone safer. Um, Alex, Steve said, you know, we don't, we're finding that while, yeah, traffic may slow down a little bit at the beginning of the work zone, they get comfortable in there, they speed up. They're still zooming at full speed uh, on through those work zones. So again, that's where having the positive protection uh, was great. And those contractors we worked with, they have really embraced the system um, and found that it uh, has made their productivity better uh, through that. So that's kind of what I have there. I want to briefly touch on a couple of other things that NTTA has done as I kind of wrap up this presentation and some things that we've done uh, to improve uh, our work zones also. One, we're working with FHWA on a pilot project for temporary orange pavement markings. While this is not a positive work zone protection, it really has, it's getting greater uh, improvement in our drivers staying in the lanes and keeping them out of the barriers and such and, and helping to keep those work zones safe. So um, we're found you know, where we've implemented it, primarily we've used it exclusively in lane shift areas rather than through the entire length of a work zone. Um, and we're working with uh, TTI on this pilot project, Texas Transportation Institute, to assess, you know, through camera usage, are the drivers staying in their lanes better? And uh, early feedback seems is it's working well. We're definitely getting positive feedback from our motorists through there. That's it, it catch. You know, it is something completely different. They see it. It makes them aware what's going on. And especially, it really helps make the striping pop in those lane shift areas where you get a lot of ghosting from uh, old lanes. One of the other elements that we've uh, done is uh, NTTA, well, here pushing 10 years ago now, um, piloted uh, and developed a barrel setting truck. And this allows us to 
uh, set barrels um, without having to have boots on the ground. Um, this was entirely an in-house invention. Uh, we hadn't seen anything on the market like this, so we actually patented it. Uh, and we are operating a couple of these, our maintenance forces uh, operate a couple of these trucks when they're setting up lane closures. Uh, basically, the, the speed of setting up a lane closure stays the same. Uh, but as you can see, our maintenance worker right there, they're ahead of the axle. So uh, it's been much improved from a safety aspect. And then finally, to kind of show wrap back to where Steve was earlier, we also use the mobile barrier system. In fact, uh, we bought our first one almost 12 years ago. First one we had, uh, we purchased ourselves. Um, it was probably about $350,000 at the time. Uh, and then subsequently have added three more units. And we acquired those through a series of uh, total routine maintenance contracts, where it basically required the maintenance contractor to uh, purchase a unit and use it when they were uh, for their maintenance activities. Um, and then at the end of the contract, the, the barrier trailer became ours. So um, we've used these, our maintenance forces use it extensively. It is quick to set up uh, a lane closure. It's kind of a demo uh, video they did. Um, and so we can get in and out setting, uh, setting up doing an activity quickly move on down the road similarly or to pick it up um, and you know looks like we'll use it just for maintenance activities as well as for uh, even our some of our specialty repairs if we may have to do a specialty uh even with a specialty contractor if it's like some bridge work or pavement work so it's worked very well for us so with that kind of Come back to the beginning, you know, safety is very part important part of our mission and keeping the roadway safe, not just for our customers, but for our contractors and our staff that works to maintain uh, the roadway system. So with that, uh, be happy to address any questions. Alan? Thank you, Mark. Uh, the first one that's up here is did you include a deflection rate in your design? What did you do if the deflection rate could not be met? We actually, we had, we did not have it in our design, but it's something that we quickly became aware of. And so as we looked at it in our placement, fortunately our tariff control plans, uh, most part had the reserve in it. But what we ended up working with the vendor on is putting in a deflection restraint, basically a heavy angle uh, behind the barrier when it was in its non-use position. So that this was, for example, on some bridge decks so that to control the deflection if it was hit, because you know, the deflections can be fairly high. I don't rec uh, recall the number off the top of my head, but I think the new system is uh, under MASH is 39 inches uh, for a deflection uh, under NHRC 350, it was only about two feet, uh, but uh, it was definitely something we had to be aware of. Thank you, Mark. The other ones up here right now are more for Steve. So uh, let's go through those. And if actually, no, here we go. Before we move on, how do the orange temporary markings function in lower light levels when headlights are in full effect? The, that is probably the one place that we're still running into some challenge with. The initial, we worked with a couple of different bead packages. We were getting uh, about 500 millicandela uh, reflectivities in the initial install. So it had really, reflectivities equal or slightly better than a yellow stripe, uh, not as quite as good as a white stripe. We have seen that the retro reflectivity tends to fall off quicker. So in about six months, we were running about 150 uh, or so was about where the retro reflectivity. So we saw a faster drop than we do with traditional striping. We're still trying to assess what's causing that. And that's part of the things we're working with TTI and potentially looking at some uh, 
other uh, bead packages, but even at night, it still retained a very good orange color. It was not coming across red. So we felt that uh, we kind of hit color wise, we hit well. Okay, so the next two questions are related to the mobile bearer trailer. So, uh, Mark, why don't you answer her question first, and then we'll get Steve's opinion on the same question. Um, first one says, it looks like there are a lot of options when procuring this unit. Are there any items you wish you would have considered when ordering your units? It has been suggested to us to do an L closure and an R closure. It sounds like there is value in the steerable rear access item. Any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, NTTAs has a, uh, the units we have have steerable rear axle, and we have found that has been very helpful, especially where we have done uh, working in some incident response where we got to close multiple lanes rather than having to try to maneuver and figure out how, how to lane change the truck to get it at a diagonal across the roadway the, the steerable rear axle has worked very well there uh having the attenuator with uh arrow board on the back definitely and the thing that we found has been very helpful was having uh speed radar in it and as part of that is is flashing speeds up to people that really slows them down we see an average of about 10 mile an hour slowdown by having that uh, speed uh, messaging on there where it reads back the, the actual speed of the drivers on that. the In terms of other options, probably the one I've heard most from from our, our maintenance folks is having the cherry picker attachment would have been helpful. Now you've got the, the left, the system is changeable left and right, uh, but that it is a bit of effort to do. So we actually, have our units configured a left configuration and a right configuration so that w either one of the trailers can be picked up and used for the applicable work zone. So Steve. Uh, I think the same we've we've uh, explored some of the options, but I think um, the, the the crane option would be one, but we're we're happy with what uh, what we have, and um, again, it it just uh, immeasurable amounts of uh, added protection for us. So uh, that in and of itself was was a selling point. Alan, back to you. Oops, I'm sorry, I was on mute. I was trying to pass it back to the Mark. Um, talking with some of the NTTA folks uh, in previous years, I think the privacy screen um, was also something that was well liked um, on it, correct? Yeah, I, I am not close enough to all the operation to uh, the unit to uh, be able to give you all the feedback in there, but yeah, that's definitely an element that can uh, help you know just the barrier itself already does just through its heights helps provide a screening when workers are on the ground and it just it helps reduce some of that uh gawking and driver distraction that you get as, as people are passing the work zone all right next question once again i guess you both can uh provide a response have you had the barrier trailer rear-ended or side swiped how much movement of the unit was experienced? What was the return to service after the unit was hit? We have been rather fortunate. I'm not aware of any side swipes. We've had had a couple of rear end collisions on our units, uh, which the uh, attenuators were able to absorb. Uh, the, the Scorpion units on the back performed as designed. And with the rest of the mass of the unit and brakes set, uh, we did not experience any, uh, the fact that the, uh, the trailer and truck moved on it. Uh, and further investigations of the trailer units showed that uh, the Scorpion unit pretty well ab absorbed all of the, that impact uh, didn't, and let's say it didn't end up shifting the unit from the stories that I've heard. Uh, I'm not aware of any side swipes we've had on it, and it's partly because it's uh, it definitely 
the tri it's just the physical presence and size of the trailer it has a reptilian effect that catches people's attention. Yeah, and we're at the toll. We were fortunate enough to that we've we've had neither. Um, I think the rear collision we can attribute to the the, the pilot and the uh, the follow up trucks that we have. So we have TMA trucks that are in the shadows and providing additional uh, maintenance of traffic and protection for the the rear of the unit. Uh, but we have not had it struck from the rear or the side. Uh, and again, I think it's as Mark was saying, it's pure presence out there provides um, an, enough awareness or situational awareness for the, the motoring public to steer clear of it as best they can. I know it's crash testing. It was crash tested at about 60 miles an hour with a, a larger uh, Dodge pickup truck and the deflection was about two feet at like 23 degrees, I believe. Uh, and that's why um, we try to keep that that distance within the, the work area inside the inside the zone there. Uh, and keep the workers and the equipment at least two plus feet away from there just just for that uh, for that reason. Okay, Mark, the sixth one is for you. How has the use of portable temporary rumble strips contributed to the overall safety within your work zones? We still underutilize the portable uh, rumble strips and that's one of those things that i'm trying to work with our maintenance department to really increase the use of it um it, it's it's an underused system um and our contractors have used it some and we find it it definitely slows people down as they first you know come through the rumble strips it it tends to slow them down but Fortunately, with a lot of long work zones, they quickly lose uh, that memory and they start to speed back up, especially um, when you've got a work zone that's fully barrier protected. Uh, sometimes I feel we get a Venturi effect through our work zones that uh, they get narrower, they wanna go a little bit faster to get out of it. So um, it's, for us, it's still very much a work in progress. And I don't know that I have uh, enough information to give a good positive feedback. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next question you both can uh, take a stab at. Uh, as contractors feel more comfortable, have you noticed any cost savings on projects from ending ahead of schedule and or a reduction in work zone crashes? I think the getting the contractors comfortable in the work zone has helped. Have we seen it finish projects earlier? I'd say we've seen probably more benefit. You know, here we saw a lot of reduced traffic during when COVID hit. Uh, COVID came on, we saw our traffic dropped uh, in excess of 50%. We're almost 60% down at first. Uh, we're still recovering. We're at about 90% of pre-COVID traffic right now. And what that did is, is allowed us to give the contractor longer work, uh, work zone periods. Uh, during, since our traffic numbers were down, we were really monitoring them on an hourly basis. We were able to extend their normal, you know, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. double lane closure. We were able to get them started 8 o'clock, maybe run them up till 6 a.m. That helped a lot of our uh time in in the project and do it but i think the bigger aspect is yeah as the contractors become familiar with the system learn how to efficiently set it up uh they're able to create more work time in it and so it, it is definitely uh save some time we're seeing projects uh finish a little bit earlier we're not necessarily seeing a cost savings because and we're working from unit price contracts um uh, on that uh, while the contractor may save a little bit of overhead, we win by getting construction done quicker, having all the lanes open, and being able to restore all of the revenue-based traffic. Because even while we're trying to keep lanes open, uh, when you do have lanes closed at night, uh, we'll still see slightly lower volumes than we would have seen otherwise. And even with sometimes the day effect is there are some people that are not comfortable driving through a construction zone and will seek an alternate route. So getting projects done, getting off the road, 
it improves safety, re reduces overall number of incidents, and it allows us to get back to full revenue collection. Steve, any thoughts from your side? So, um, as far as our usage for contractors, we haven't allowed any of that. Um, it's it's mainly uh, utilized for our maintenance forces in house, and again for Illinois State Police investigations. Um, and on that side, I could say we've seen the uh, the, the savings of time mainly um, in deployment for the the mobile operation specifically. If it's something to where uh, we could subtract a few pieces of equipment. Uh, as far as TMAs or um, our stake body trucks or uh, any of our other maintenance of traffic vehicles uh, and utilize the, this mobile work zone barrier, uh, that's that's a, a time saving for us. Uh, again, that subtracts a couple workers from the, 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 the work zone itself uh, by having just one operator and this provides the, uh, the side uh, intrusion protection. So as far as that's concerned, again, we haven't utilized it or allowed contractors to utilize it in, in that regard. Uh, but in-house, we've definitely seen a, a time and, uh, and a safety increase. Thank you, Steve. That wraps up all the questions that have uh, been entered so far with the exception of one, which I can handle, which is, will the recordings of these sessions be available? Uh, yes, it is being recorded and as soon as the Files able to be processed and uploaded to Federal Highways Work Zone Management uh, Program website. It will be out there. Uh, I would can't put a time on that, just um, but I would look for it later this summer. Uh, feel free to uh, email me uh, if you have. Um, if you don't see it out there, uh, I, I'll try to fill you in over the summer as I, as I hear more. So, if there are any other questions, please enter them now. Otherwise, we will turn this over to Martha, which I will do right now. Oops, here we go. Okay, here we go. All right, there you go. Whoops. There you go, Martha. Perfect, thank you. Well, before I share these additional uh, resources, I want to thank Steve and Mark for their great presentations. Uh, so the information that uh, some of the tools and, and information shared today, uh, it's available on the Federal Highway Work Zone Management Program website, as well as the National Work Zone uh, Safety Information Clearinghouse. On the Clearinghouse website, we have a web page dedicated to Smarter Work Zone. So I encourage everyone uh, to visit that site as well. Next slide, please. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to contact Joat Parasha uh, from our Office of Operations. And again, I want to thank Steve and, and Mark and all of you for joining us today. And uh, if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.